But for today, we're going to continue the series that we've been in for the last few weeks called Unstoppable. And if you're just joining with us, we've been looking through the book of Acts. The book of Acts in the New Testament, which describes in great detail the, the, the movement of God through the early church as the message of Christ was expanding throughout the known world at that time. We've been looking at attributes that made that early church unstoppable in such a unique and powerful way. We've looked at the way the Holy Spirit empowers uh, empowered the early believers to be radically generous, to be obedient, to be bold in their witness to Christ. Last week, uh, Robert Gilliland, Pastor Robert, talked about how the Spirit empowers us to be unified, that there's a big difference between diversity and division, and the Spirit of God wants us to be unified. We looked at that last week and the unity that took place in the early church. Today, we're going to talk about the subject of community and how the Holy Spirit empowers the church to be a unique and powerful type of community in the world. Now, here's what's unique about human relationships. Human relationships are so interesting because right now when you think about it, it is easier for us to be connected to one another than it has ever been in the history of the world. We know more information about one another than, honestly, we probably need to know about each other. We know more random information. We know more personal information. Sometimes we know way too much intimate information about people because we just live online. We live out there in the world. We put it all out there for everybody to know. We are more connected digitally and and socially than we have ever been in the history of the world. In fact, you've probably heard the old phrase, six degrees of separation. It's the theory that Everybody in the world is really only six introductions away from every other person on the planet. And yet, over the last several years, there's been much written about this with the onslaught of social media, that that number keeps coming down, that right now we're really more like only three and a half degrees of separation from any other person on the planet, which is amazing when you think about it. We know more about each other than we have ever known, and yet, as a society and as a people, the human race is probably more isolated and alone than we have been at any point in history. And here's why that is so important. When you look at the way that you and I are created, God made us in a very unique way. He made us, he designed us as people that need meaningful community. We were designed to need meaningful community. You know this to be true. I know this to be true. In fact, in the book of Genesis, even if we didn't know it to be true personally, we even read about it in the opening chapters of of the Word of God. It says in Genesis that the only thing that would not be good about God's creation is that man would remain forever alone. And so he made us to need one another. He made not just one person, but he made people to be fruitful and multiply and to live in community with one another. This is why solitary confinement is used not as a reward for people, but as a punishment for people. Because we were designed for meaningful community. You've never had anyone ever reward someone and say, here's how I'm going to reward you. I'm going to make you be by yourself for the next year. And even those of you watching this that are introverts that would say, man, I need my alone time. Hey, I get that. Um, I've always described myself as an extroverted introvert. As much as I love people and I love being around people, I I need my alone time as well. But even for those of you that are full-blown introverts, if all you are is alone and never with people, it is not a good thing. And the reason why is because God designed us needing meaningful community. And when you look at how you and I make and form this meaningful community, there's a few things that I've realized when it comes to how we meet this need that we have for meaningful community. Most community that we form is actually formed around two things. It's formed around commonality and proximity. I mean, when you think about it, the meaningful community, the relationships that you and I have with one another Most of those relationships were formed around commonality and proximity, things we have in common. You know, maybe you're you're a part of a group that you're you're a part of a mom's group, or you're part of a, 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 a cyclist group, or you're part of a triathlon group, things that you have in common that you like to do together. Um, maybe you like to to golf or to fish or whatever it might be. Church groups are often formed around things we have in common. Um, by age or by season of life or sometimes by interest. Um, But not only do we form community around commonality, we also quite often form community around proximity, right? I mean, it's just convenient. The people that you work with or you live next to or you go to school with. Commonality is like 
politics or ideologies or faith. Those commonalities and those proximities is usually where we form our deepest relationships. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. I'm not saying that it is. But here's one truth about the community that we form around the things we have in common and the proximity we have to one another. Commonality and proximity changes over time. It, they, they always change over time. Things you once had in common with someone, it's inevitable at some point in time in the future that commonality might change. You, uh, the people you hang out with in sixth grade were probably different than the people you hung out with in fifth grade because you left elementary school and went to middle school and your friend group changed. Your proximity to them was no longer what, what it was. Just grab your high school yearbook for those of us that have those still. Dig them out, dust them off, open it up to the back or to the front where everybody was signing it, you know, um, on that last week of school when you got your yearbooks. And you look at the things, especially your senior year, at things that people would write in your yearbooks. You know, they would write things like, You're a wonderful person, don't ever change, stay the same, you know, all those lies we tell about each other, just trying to be friendly and nice. But at some point, somebody probably also is going to say this keep in touch, right? Keep in touch. And the next time you talk to that person, at your 10-year high school reunion. Why? Because proximity changes our relationships over time. We're just not around people and our relationships change. But also sometimes the things we have in common change that affects the relationships we have with one another. Maybe you were single and you, and you get married. It's going to change some of the things you had in common with your friends group. doesn't mean you can't be friends. doesn't mean you don't like each other and can't hang out, but that commonality has changed. Or you were married without kids and suddenly you have kids. Some of the things you had in common changed. Or you're a mom that was looking for a preschool play group and now you're a a middle school soccer mom. Your commonalities sometimes change. Or you go from working to retirement. Or you know, you're, went from 50 years of marriage to being a widow or a widower. Your commonalities that you shared with some of your friends change over time. And when those commonalities and that proximity changes, so does the relationships we have with one another. Now, here's what we're going to find in the book of Acts. We're going to look at a story today of a guy named Paul who, by the way, Paul is one of the most prominent figures in all of the New Testament. I'll get there in just a minute. But we're going to look at a relationship that he had with a group of people in the city of Ephesus. And what we're going to find through this story is how the Holy Spirit empowers Christian community with one another to be different. Because the Holy Spirit, this is what we've seen throughout the book of Acts. We have seen the Holy Spirit empowers the people of God to be witnesses to the kingdom of God. And what we're going to see today specifically is the way the Spirit of God empowers us as the people of God to have a different type of community with one another than we would have with anyone else. How the community of God's people should be different than the community of in the world, how we should look a little different and be a little different and act a little different and think a little differently. So if you have a Bible, I invite you to open that or your app to Acts chapter 20. This is where we're going to be today in Acts chapter 20. And as you're turning there, let me give you a little bit of background about this story, because this is actually, we've skipped ahead quite a bit into chapter 20. We've looked at the story of guys named Philip um, and, and Peter and John and all these other uh, very well-known characters in the early church. But we're going to look today at Paul, and Paul's story is this. His, he was referred to early on in Christian history as Saul, and he was known as a Pharisee of the Jewish people. That simply meant he was an expert in the Jewish religious law and what it meant to be a dedicated follower of God. But one thing Paul was known for is that he did not like, in fact, you could say he even hated the followers of Jesus, so much so that he was known to be a ruthless persecutor of their faith. Now, I, earlier in Acts, we, were, we, we find the story of Paul headed to a city called Damascus where he's going to arrest some that are followers of Jesus. And on the way, he has this encounter with Christ that changes his life. He becomes a follower of Jesus. He goes from being this, this person that hated the followers of Christ to being one of the most vo the loud, boisterous proponents and advocates for, the, for following Christ. He becomes a, a, an apostle for Jesus Christ, and he is known throughout Acts. In fact, most of the rest of Acts, after about Acts chapter 15, it's almost entirely dedicated to the story of Paul's life from that point on and how what are known, what we refer to as his missionary journeys, three different journeys he took, telling people about Jesus and starting churches. Along the way, he ends up in the city of Ephesus. Ephesus is one of the most important cities in all of ancient Rome. 
In fact, it's, many believe that it was second in size only to Rome itself. It was enormous, huge population. It was very wealthy. It was home to uh, a lot of different religious ideas, but in particular, uh, it had one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the Temple of Artemis, because that was the center of their worship in the city of Ephesus. Paul ends up there, meets some Jewish believers that have heard about the way a little bit, but they're not fully understanding all that Jesus came to do and to teach. And he begins to tell them about Christ, and they begin to believe, and this, this church is formed in the city of Ephesus. And over the next three years or so. He spends about three years in total, a little bit more in the city of Ephesus, and they become very near and dear to his heart. The church in Ephesus are very close with Paul. Paul's very close with them. They know each other. They love each other. Paul is mentoring them, teaching them, investing in them in very, in very significant ways. But when we get to chapter 20, what's happening is Paul's on his way to Jerusalem and he's also realizing that it's very likely that he will never, ever see the believers in Ephesus again. And so he calls the leaders of the church to a neighboring town to meet with him, to basically tell them goodbye and to leave them with some instructions. And we read about, in, in, in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 20, some things about this interaction. And here's one of the things he says in Acts chapter 20, um, verse 18. He says this about uh, to them. He says, you yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set forth, foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me. Now here's what we're going to find and I want you to really pay attention to as we walk through this story. Paul is speaking to these leaders of the church in Ephesus for what he is convinced is the final time and he wants to leave them with some very important reminders about who he was for them and what they accomplished together. And one of the first things he says to them is he reminds them, you know how I lived among you. The whole time that I was with you, from the first day I met you until this moment right here, and how I was serving the Lord with you with all humility, and I served the Lord with tears, he says, and with trials, all of these things that were happening to me. Now, what does all of that mean? Here's what it means, and here's what I want you to take away from this. The Christian community, when the Holy Spirit empowers Christian community, one of the first things we see is that Christian community puts your needs ahead of mine. Christian community is defined by being empowered by the Holy Spirit to put your needs above my needs in a way that is supernaturally different than the rest of the world. Because here's the thing, everybody's done this at some point. Everybody at some point has made a sacrifice. Everybody at some point has done something kind or sacrificial to serve somebody else, to not only serve myself, but to serve you, maybe even a greater way than I normally put myself. But what we see happening in the early church is that the Spirit of God is empowering the people of God to do this in a way that no one had ever experienced before. And for no personal gain. In fact, we talked about this a few weeks. The generosity that the Holy Spirit empowered in the local church. That they took everything they had and they gave it away and served anyone as they had need. And it resulted in them having favor with all the people. That is a, an extreme way of putting someone else's needs above your own. That's what we see happening in the early church in the book of Acts. And remember, what did Paul say? The whole time I was with you, it wasn't just once in a while, it wasn't just here or there, the whole time I was with you from the first day up until this very last day, I have set you an example of putting your needs above my needs because that's what the community of the gospel of Jesus Christ looks like. And, and friends, if I'm being honest with you, that, that's just different than the way I normally think about your needs and my needs. Normally, I get up in the morning, and you know the very first thing I'm thinking about, the very first person I'm thinking about? You know who it is? It's me. I get up thinking about me. I don't wake up thinking about you. I don't, if I'm honest, even wake up thinking about my family. I wake up thinking, I'm thirsty. I need to get a glass of water. I, I, I get up thinking about what appointments that I have, and what am I going to wear that day, and an important Question for me is, where am I going to have lunch that day? You know, I mean, the, the important things. I'm trying to think about my life, everything that I want. And I'm willing to bet you're the same way. Christian community doesn't start there, though. It starts by saying, what are your needs, and how can I put your needs in this moment above mine? And why do we do that? Because that's the example that Jesus set for us. Writing to another church uh, in the city of Philippi, Paul worded it this way at another point in time. He says, look, do nothing from selfish ambition 
or conceit, but in humility. He uses that word again. Count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Important to note that Christian uh, sacrificing, Christian community putting your needs above mine, doesn't say that I don't care about what's going on with me. It doesn't say I neglect myself. It just says, look, I'm not looking only after myself, but I'm going to put a significance and a priority on what's going on in your life. How can I serve you? That's what Christian community does. And the Holy Spirit in the church empowers that to happen in a way that is not possible any other place. Holy Spirit-empowered community puts your needs above mine. The second thing we find that when that happens, what happens in the church, when the Holy Spirit empowers in our community, is that when we're putting your needs above mine, the second thing that happens is that it makes you better than you were by making you more like Christ. Now, I want you to think about this statement because it might sound a little odd the way that I worded this, that Holy Spirit-empowered community makes you better than you were. But it does. It makes me better than I was. By being around you, by being, other follow, being around other followers of Christ. And the reason it makes me better than I was, that makes you better than you were, is because Christian community empowered by the Holy Spirit is going to make you more like Jesus. And the more you and I become like Jesus, the better we become. We just become better human beings. We become, become better followers of God. We begin become better lovers of people and lovers of God. We become better the more we are around a Holy Spirit-empowered community because it makes us and pushes us constantly to be more like Jesus. That is the result of Christian community. And it's always been that way. In fact, one of my favorite Old Testament scriptures Actually, let's look at this first. Look at Acts chapter 20, verse 20. Look at what Paul says about this and how he, he tried to accomplish this. He says, I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable. Now remember, he's, he's saying these things to a group of church leaders that he's seeing for the very last time, and he's trying to impart to them things that are most important to him for them to continue. And he says, here's what I never shrank back from. Ever, the whole time I was with you, I put your needs above my needs, and I did not shrink back from declaring to you anything that was profitable. In other words, my entire time with you, my entire relationship with you, my focus has been how do I benefit you? How do I ensure that you are better off than you were by hanging around me? I don't want my relationship with you to end up in you being worse off. I don't want to be a bad example. I don't want to be a bad influence. I want to be a good example and a good influence and a godly influence. I want to make sure that when our relationship is over and we're no longer able to hang out because of proximity, because I'm no longer here and we're no longer around each other and I don't have the opportunity to be that meaningful source of community to you anymore, I want you to be clear that the entire time I was with you, this was my goal, that I would make sure everything I did was profitable to you. It was beneficial to you. And I want you to keep that same attitude going. And again, this is the way it's always been for the people of God. This is not a new idea in Scripture. In, in the Old Testament, uh, there's, a, there's a story and a time in the nation of Israel's history where they end up basically prisoners of war in Babylon after they were destroyed and, and, uh, and overtaken and defeated. And Babylon takes many of them back to their country as captives or prisoners of war. And as prisoners in a foreign land, the, the, being, being under their rule, not as they want it to be, here's what God tells them to do through the prophet Jeremiah. He says, here's what your attitude needs to look like in this foreign country that has taken you captive. Seek the welfare of the city and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you'll find your welfare. Here's what I want you to do as prisoners, as captives in Babylon. Seek their good. Benefit them. Seek their welfare. Because that's what I've called you to do. That's who I've called you to be. Friends, Christian community has always been and always will be at its core. How do we serve one another, putting your needs above mine, so that in the end, your relationship with me would be beneficial to you? I want to make sure that you are better off having known me, spending time with me, living next door to me, working beside me, because of what God has done in me, he's gonna, I want him to work through me to make your life 
better. That's what Holy Spirit-empowered community looks like. And you know what Paul's saying to the church leaders in Ephesus when he says, look, here's what I did from day one. I never shrunk back from making sure that everything I did for you was profitable. He's basically saying, I want you to do something. I want you to carry on this legacy. In fact, he says it that bluntly in another letter to the church in Corinth. He says, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. When you see Christ in me, hey, imitate that. I've made sure that I was doing everything I could to benefit you, for our relationship to be profitable for you. Imitate that. Make sure the world around you as a follower of Christ is better off because you were there. Now, how do, how do we do that? How do we make sure that happens? Well, the third thing that I want to point out in this story of, of Acts 20 and Paul and the leaders in Ephesus is that when it comes to the way the Holy Spirit empowers us to live this out, here's what this looks like. The Holy Spirit is going to empower the community of God to stir up love and good to grow God's kingdom. Throughout the book of Acts, we find this happening, that the Holy Spirit, through the community of the believers, was stirring up other believers to do good, was stirring up other believers to love well. And the reason he was stirring up love and good works is so that the kingdom of God would grow, that it would advance. One of my favorite scriptures about this is found in Hebrews chapter 10. Here's what the author of Hebrews writes. Let us consider... <laughs> and I love this word. Let us consider. Let us give thought. Let us open our minds and open our hearts and actually be intentional about this. Let us consider how to stir up one another towards love and good works, encouraging one another. Now, I, I don't know if you have any friends or, or, or family members, maybe that this is true, but we probably all have someone in our life that, that you know there's just some subjects that when they're around you should probably not bring up because it's going to stir them up just a little bit. You know what I'm talking about? Like, hey, when, when they get here today, when, they, when we're getting get together for Thanksgiving, make sure you don't bring up whatever it might be. Maybe politics. It may be who knows what, right? Don't bring up that subject. Don't get uncle so-and-so stirred up about that. You, you, you know what I'm getting at, right? I mean, we can just, there, there's things that we can stir up in, 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 in each other. Well, when our relationships in the communities that we have of influence in our life, you know, it can stir up a lot of things inside of us. It can stir up things that are good, and it can stir up things that are not so good. In fact, today, in our current climate and culture, it's not hard to look out and see people getting stirred up about a whole lot of things. Some of them that are beneficial, some of them that are good, some of them that are worthy, and sometimes people getting stirred up in ways that are not good and are not beneficial and honestly are not worthy of getting quite that upset and stirred up about. When the Holy Spirit empowers the church to be a Christ-centered community, when we get together, the only thing that will be stirred up if we're truly pursuing the righteousness and godliness of God is love and good. When the church is together, that's what the Holy Spirit is stirring up. And if you're around a group of people or you are a person that's stirring up anything other than those two things, love and good and even encouragement, then friend, that's not the Holy Spirit at work in you because the Holy Spirit is only going to stir up things that are loving, things that are good, things that are godly, and that are going to grow the kingdom of God. In fact, in, in Acts, it even talks about how, how Paul, Paul makes mention of how he quotes the words of Jesus who says it is more blessed to give than to receive. Jesus said it this way in Matthew chapter 5 in his first sermon. He says, let your light shine before others so that they would see your good works and they would give glory to your Father who's in heaven. Jesus himself has called us to be people of good whose good works shine a light. Don't bring darkness. That bring freedom. Don't bring um, anything else. Don't bring uh, negative and pain and suffering and bondage and all of those things because our good works are shining light in a way that gives glory to God our Father. So let's look at this again and what we've seen in Acts chapter 20. In Paul's final words to the church in Ephesus, what does he say to them? He says, here's what Holy Spirit empowered community looks like. And it's these three things. He said, Holy Spirit and power community will always put your needs above my needs. It will make you better and more like Christ. 
And Holy Spirit-empowered community will stir up love and good. That's what the Spirit of God will do in the community of the followers of Jesus. Now, as I wrap this up, I want to ask you to do something. I want to ask you to kind of tune back in with me for just a minute. And I say that because I know what it's like to watch this from home. At this point in the message, if you're like me, you're up getting a second or third cup of coffee. Maybe you're making some pancakes right now. You know, you're kind of listening, but you're kind of not. I get that. I'm not calling anybody out. I've been there, done that, right? It's all good. But I want to ask you to tune back in to what I'm going to say as I wrap this up because I think this is so incredibly timely and important for all of us. When you think about the last six months that we've had as a people, and I mean humanity's had as a people, for most of us, our, our source of, of meaningful community has been disrupted because of proximity. We've not been able to be with the people that we're used to being with in the ways we are used to being with them. Our normal routine ceased almost overnight earlier this spring. And it was replaced by different types of interaction that we've had with, with one another. Because our normal ways we would engage in meaningful community were just no longer available, at least not right now. And here's the thing that I've learned about people. And this is true with me, I think it's true for you. People will always search out meaningful community. We're gonna find it. We're gonna find a way to interact. We're gonna find a way um, to, to have community with people based on things we have in common or just our proximity to one another. And I think that's actually continued over the last six months. If anything, it's, it's, it's increased in, in a variety of ways, but especially through the proximity of, of this right here. Most of our proximity for, for community right now, it really is taking place right here on our phones, on our computers, on our tablets, online, digitally, virtual, virtually, social media, whatever you want to refer to it as. This has become the new place of proximity that we're hanging out with people. This is the new place that we engage with people based on commonalities. But you do realize that, especially on social media, the places that we get our information, that those platforms are actually programmed to give us more information based on the things we already prefer. Like it knows what you search, it knows what websites you like to go to, it knows what news sources you like to listen to, it knows what bend you tend to be politically or ideologically or religiously. It's got all of that and it actually is programmed to filter the things that you are hearing and seeing and saying and learning from based on what you already prefer. So in other words, where a lot of us moved to six months ago because we couldn't be in the proximity of one another like we always could in the past, where we started getting that meaningful community, is a place that's actually designed to tell you what you want to hear. And the problem with only or predominantly being told the things that we want to hear is that it can begin, if we're not careful, to stir up things that are not so good. And when we look at the world around us right now, it's not hard to see a lot of things that have been stirred up that are not good. Not just diversity, as we talked about last week, but division. Not just concern, but anger and hate. Not just um, discourse and conversation, but, but rage and malice and content, all kinds of things. You can't bring up any subject at all right now, it seems like. Without that conversation, if it's different than what I think or believe, it's going to lead to stir up something in me that honestly is not beneficial, that's not helpful, and is not all that godly. I don't have to convince you of that. I don't think. It's not very hard to see. We all know that's true. But here's what I am concerned about. What I'm most concerned about is that we're getting to a season where it's not all that different for the church either. Because, friends, when the Holy Spirit is empowering us, what, what's going to be stirred up when we truly are seeking the character of Christ are these things right here. As the community of Christ, what the Spirit is going to stir up in us is my willingness to put your needs above mine. What the Holy Spirit wants to stir up in me is that I would make you better just by being around you, that I could encourage you that you could follow my example because I'm following the example of Christ. And as I follow your example, I would be made better because you're following the example of Christ, that we would make one another better because we're putting one another's needs above our own. And in all of it, we are working and longing and striving to stir up nothing except love and good. 
Because when we stir up love and good and we encourage one another to do the same, the kingdom of God is unstoppable. Friends, at the end of the day, it's really not about what I think. It's really not about my preference. It's really not about me at all. In the beginning, you and I were created in the image of a God that blessed us and put us in this earth and said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion, have a blast in this world that I've given you and created you. And unfortunately, sin has distorted the image of God ever since man fell in the beginning. But God's redemption story is at work, changing me from the inside out. To not be a person that is stirring up strife, not being a person that's stirring up malice, not being a person that's stirring up division and anger and hate and all of those things, but to be a person that is stirring up only what is defined by love and what is good. Because I'm going to be a person that puts your needs above mine that seeks to make you better. And church, here's what I want to ask, and I want to ask you to be praying about. Wouldn't it be something if our local community looked at the, those that were a part of the church at South Lake, and they saw the great diversity that is our church. People of different backgrounds, different denominational preferences, different political parties, different race, different socioeconomic backgrounds. People that on any given day, there's a variety of subjects that they do not fully agree on. And yet, when they get together, they seem to only ever stir up love and good. There's just something different. I know they don't agree. I know they don't always see things the same way, but they seem to always be stirring up love and stirring up what's good. And I'm just a better person having been around them, having spent time with them, living next door to them, working beside them. I'm just better being around them. If we'll take that approach, if we'll let the Holy Spirit empower us to be that kind of community, from what I see in the book of Acts, I think that will make the kingdom of God in Claremont, Florida, and around our world unstoppable. And I don't really care what everybody else is or is not doing. I can't control them. I can control me. You can control you. And friends, I'm asking you, let's be a church that makes this our goal, to let the Holy Spirit empower us, to be a place that stirs up in every way we can love and good for the glory of God, for the benefit of others, so that the kingdom of God can be advanced in this world. This week, as you get together in your life groups, I hope that you'll spend a lot of time discussing this right now and how you and I can do this and be a part of this. Uh, if you're not in a life group, man, I would encourage you to consider participating in one. And I know we, all of you may not be able to gather in person right now. If you're not a part of a group and would like to be, we have a virtual group that meets every Monday night led by the director of our life groups here, Cesar Perez. You can go to church at southlake.com slash virtual group. We can get you signed up for that. You can be a part of that tomorrow night. We'd love for you to engage in that because here's why continuing this discussion beyond Sunday morning is so important. It's one thing to hear the words that I've said today and look at what the Word of God says. And it's something different to have the practical application of these words pressed into our life so that we actually do them. And friends, I hope you'll be a part of, helping, of us helping one another do this right here. That this would characterize and define who we are as a church. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for the words that you wrote, inspired Luke to write down for us to have a record of how Paul and the church in Ephesus spent time together, the way that he loved them and stirred them up to what was good, that he made every effort to benefit them and profit them because of his relationship with them. God, the fact is right now we live in an age where people are eager to stir up a lot of things. And if we're honest, everything that's being stirred up in our culture right now is not good. And it does not come from a place of love. But God, rather than being a, a, a group of people that stand so focused on all that is bad, may we focus, God, through your Holy Spirit on being a people that stir up love and goodness. That we direct people to you. That the people around us would be better off having spent time with us. Not because we stir up 
political ideologies or stir up opinions or stir up ideas or all of that, but because at our core, we're people that work and strive every day to stir up love and good, the kind of love and good that come only through a relationship with your son, Jesus Christ. God, may we be that kind of community in this world today and every day. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.